open your Bibles tonight to Genesis chapter 1. Normally when Dwayne asks for a title for a message I'm going to preach, I have to hesitate and think about it and so forth. Well, this one was pretty easy. The title of this message is Revelation versus Imagination. I think you'll see why it has that title. I recently came across some photographs, old photographs of one Christmas. I suppose Luke was about three and a half or four years old and he had gotten a set of Superman pajamas complete with a red detachable cape. And having no idea what I was about to create, I said, do you want to fly? He said, yeah. And I put my hand under his little chest and got him right about the knees and lifted him up and I said, here we go. I mean, this quick he went. <laughs> In his imagination, he was flying. He was flying. And he just about killed me that Christmas, flying him all over the house. Well, the next photo I came to was one of my mother had, with her sisters, been to Hawaii. And she had brought uh, Luke and Carrie gifts. And among those gifts were some grass skirts. Now, Carrie in the picture has her little grass skirt on, and in her imagination, buddy, she's on the beach in Waikiki, and she is, she's a hula dancer. Luke, in his little grass skirt, is standing there as if somebody had just handed him a raw buzzard sandwich and said, this is going to be your dinner and it's really good. <laughs> his little look is just, he is, in his imagination, this is the most humiliating picture in his life to that date. And you know, we think flights of imagination in children are cute, don't we? Now, there comes a point, however, at 13 and 14 when they're imaginary friends, it's not so funny anymore, is it? And Brother Gene Rutledge back there is in his 70s. I tell you what, if he came through the door tonight in a Superman suit and said, I can fly, we're ready to put you in the loony bin, Gene. <laughs> So you see how imagination, the perception of it, changes over time. By definition, imagination is a form of mind work. Digging a ditch is physical work. It's a form of body work. Thinking is brain work. Working the mind. Let me show you what where the word comes from. Genesis 1, if you got verse 26, this is the first time it's used in the scripture. The root word image. God said, let us, now that's the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit, they're one, and the three of them as one said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Now down verse 27, so God created man, in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Adam was a man created of God, a figure who represents all men. Adam was a representative of every man that would ever be born and woman. God made man as a representative figure. And God is spirit. And as such, now try to follow me here with this, God needs no body. He can be who He is without a body. He needs no muscles to accomplish His work. He merely speaks and a thing is done. 
You say, no, nah, wait a minute. You know, the skeptic who goes, hey, that's just ridiculous. Well, I could understand a couple hundred years ago if somebody said that, but how many of you have one of these little black boxes now? And you do this, and you go, call Paul Wamsley for me. Hello, this is Paul. You speak, and it is done. Now, if God can give men this power, can He not have that power? He just speaks, and the universe was created. The millions of stars were just cast out into space. He needs no muscles to accomplish His work. God, He thinks, and a thing, it comes to pass. It's done. He just thinks it. Man, although he was made in the image of God, and please hear this. Man, though he was created in the image of God, is not God. Man is a representative figure made by God in the image of God, in the likeness of God. And that's what he is. When God imaged man... Like everything God does, man was created perfect and upright in the image of God. And it's only when man disobeyed God, when man sinned, when man decided that he would be God, he would be as God if he ate the fruit, that man's image changed. It got twisted. It became evil. Turn over a few pages to Genesis 5. Here's where the word went from image to imagination. When Adam sinned, his mind didn't work properly anymore. He no longer could think right. Man became a creature of imaginations or twisted, untrue, inaccurate thinking. Look at Genesis Five, uh, 6 verse 5, and God saw, Genesis 6 verse 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now if I read that right, it says it's not that we have a few moments or an occasional day when we think evil twisted things. No, every moment, every thought, all day, every day is evil. That's all we do. Left alone, every man, all men, all women, we come forth from our... I saw something recently that was amazing. They now have a machine they can put on, a, on an expectant mother's tummy and they can see the infant in there, the unborn infant. Well, this thing was of twins in there. And you know what they were doing? They were having a kick fist fight. I mean, they were banging each other and kicking one another. And the funny thing about it, the story was like, can you believe these, these poor little innocent things are fighting? <laughs> They've never obviously read the Bible. We come forth from our mother's womb speaking lies, hatred, venom. That surprised me. They were fighting. It's a miracle they hadn't killed each other in there. <laughs> We go to the grave speaking lies. Why? Why would somebody be that way or do that? Because the thoughts and therefore the words and the deeds of all men and women are twisted. Our whole head is sick. It's full of twisted thoughts. Let me give you the sum total on imagination. Here it is. Everything we imagine about ourselves in a positive way I tell you, it's not nearly as good as we think it is. The minute I removed my hands, Luke could have found out how well he flew. When we're feeling really good about something we did, it's not nearly as good as we think. There's always a motive. When we look in the mirror and go, man, I'm looking good tonight, it's not nearly as good as we think. The truth is, you see, that anything positive that we think about ourselves is a lie. It's twisted. It's just an imagination. 
And if any of us ever do anything that can be called good, it's only because we've been born again and Christ is in us and He's doing the good in us. The flip side of that is everything we imagine about ourselves in a negative way. What we imagine, it's not nearly as bad as the truth is about us if it were known. Oh, it's a lot worse than we think. When we just uh, casually slander somebody and later think, you know, that wasn't very nice of me. It's a lot worse than that. And God said, you just murdered that person. When we whine and complain about ourselves and our circumstances, we think, I'm finding fault with God's providence. It's just a lot worse than that. We think we'd be a better God than God is. Think we know more than He does. Turn over to 2 Corinthians 5 with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So, as the Scriptures teach, God has chosen, chosen from the children of men a people whom He determined from the foundation of the world to save. What does He do with their twisted minds and their imagination? What does He do with it? Well, I don't know how many of you ever been fishing, but there's a, several kind of fishing rods, but one of them is called a bait casting rod. And you crank it like this, and the reel goes around, the line comes in, and when you throw it, you put your thumb on it, and you throw it out there, but now, as soon as it hits the water, Paul, you better put your thumb back on it, right? Because if you don't, it just goes, and it creates a bird's nest, a backlash. Now, occasionally you can get it out of there, but most of the time, you do it bad enough, you know what you got to do? You've got to cut the whole business off and start over. You know what God does with our twisted minds, our imagination, if He intends to save us? Look here in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God doesn't fix the old man, the old imagination up. No, he just, he doesn't fix the old heart. He doesn't fix the old mind. No, he's going to do surgery. There's got to be a replacement made here. God saves a sinner not by fixing the old twisted heart and mind. No, God replaces him with a perfect heart and a perfect mind. You say, that sounds like surgery. Well, it is of sorts. Remember, God doesn't need a body. He doesn't need hands or eyes to do surgery. He can do it simply by speaking, and it's done. By using His Word, the Spirit of a God performs surgery on a person. I'll give you an example of this back in Acts 16. The way God does this is He sends a preacher to speak His Word, to replace a twisted heart and mind with a perfect heart and mind. And here's a clear example of this surgery in Acts 16, verse 14. There was a certain woman. And by the way, you notice it doesn't say all women. There was a certain woman. This was a child of God, one in whom he determined to do surgery. A certain woman named Lydia. He knew her by name. She was a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, and she worshipped God. And it, you know how she got to doing that? She heard. It says right there, she heard. Whose heart the Lord opened. There it is. He'll do surgery. That she attended unto the things which are spoken to Paul. And when she was baptized, that'll be the first evidence that somebody's had this heart and mind surgery. Is they'll want to tell everybody. They want to get in that pool and declare before God... I know I had the surgery. I know it. You did it. <laughs> and her household heard and was baptized, and she besought us, saying, If I have judged him, judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and abide there. And she constrained us. She'll want to abide where the word is preached. Now, find Matthew 23. Whenever someone has this surgery, for that matter, when somebody has any kind of surgery, there's always some result. 
Someone has a bad knee and they have surgery in hopes that they can walk without pain. Somebody has poor vision and they have LASIK surgery in hopes that they'll have 20-20 vision. Now, with men surgeons, you know, surgeries don't always go exactly as they're planned. Sometimes a person having simple knee surgery winds up crippled. A person with LASIK winds up blind. Or they can die from these surgeries. You know why? Men aren't perfect surgeons. They're not. And religious surgeons are little more than butchers. Look what they do in Matthew 23. I want to give you this warning. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. These are the religious surgeons. They're hypocrites. For what you do is you compass sea and land. You look high and low to make one proselyte, one person who will let you do surgery on them. And when he's made, when you've done it, you've made him twofold more the child of hell than you were. You killed him. <laughs> killed him not just in this life, but eternally. False preachers promise life, yet they deliver only death, double death. Christ, on the other hand, in the Scriptures is called the great physician. How many surgeries do you think he's botched? He gives life. He gives twofold life. He changes your life in this life. And then he gives eternal life. All his surgeries are perfect. They turn out just like they're planned. I, I had an interesting conversation with a man who sells medical things to surgeons and he told me that every surgeon he's ever met starts an operation with plan A. This is what they're going to do. But just in case it doesn't quite go the way he thinks, he's got plan B. The fallback. He said he even met a surgeon once who had a plan C. I don't know if I want that guy cutting on me or not, but... <laughs> the true and living God has one plan. It's the same plan for each and every surgery. It always goes just as he planned it. It's always successful. There's always complete recovery. No, it's even better than that. When the Spirit of God operates, the results... It's not that you... It's not like, well, he never... It, he looks like he never was sick. You have somebody... Well, you walk right now, you don't even look like you ever had surgery. It's not like that. No, no. You never had it. You never were sick. God's people, when they get to glory, you can look at them any way upside down, any way you want to. They never were sick. Because the Lord Jesus Christ was never sick. He was born, lived perfectly, and died. And you and I, if we're in Him, we're perfect too. You say, how's that happen? I don't pretend to understand it fully, but I fully believe it. How's that happen? I don't really know, but by faith I believe. And all God's people, the surgery will give you a heart that believes and a mind that understands to some extent that Christ is all and in all. If you got Him, you don't have any other problems. You don't need to imagine anything. Nothing you can imagine can be as good as this. Look at Luke chapter 10 with me. Every new heart patient of God believes what by faith has been revealed to them. The new heart and mind no longer depend upon imagining things. No, the truth, the reality of things is revealed. Man's religion is all about imagination. They're just making it up as they go. It's twisted. Look here at Luke 10. Here's the simple truth of it. Luke chapter 10, verse 21. We read, In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent. You know who the wise and the prudent are? They're the Pharisees and they're the religious people. That's who's, they think they're smarter than the rest of it. They think they know more than the rest of us. They just have more vivid imaginations. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and as what's this word? Revealed. Revealed the truth. 
revealed them unto babes. Babes? Yeah, his children. His little children. Aaron, you and Jamie got two babes downstairs. They're your children. God's ch you want the best for them? You wouldn't lie to them? You wouldn't deceive them? You wouldn't do anything to bring them eternal harm? Or even harm in this life? If you could help it. Well, God can help it. And therefore, everything He shows His children is the truth. He reveals who He is, what He's done, why He's done it, where He is now. You see here verse 22. The reason for it, it says, Father, so it seemed good in thy sight. Verse 22, all things are delivered to me of my Father. And pay attention here. No man knows who the Son is. Aren't you glad there's not a period there? Now it goes on. No man knows who the Son is but the Father. The Father knows who the Son is. And then it says, and who the Father is. Nobody knows who that is but the Son. Aren't you glad there's not a period there? And then there's the word, and. And. You know who else knows who the Father and the Son are? He to whom the Son reveals Him. If we're going to learn who God is, if instead of depending on our imagination as to who He is, God's going to have to reveal Him and Christ is the one who's got to do it. Now, where are you going to hear about Christ? Where are you going to hear from Christ? Where two or three are met together, I'll be in your midst. That's where I want to be. He to whom the Son will reveal Him. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Revelation is not only superior to imagination, revelation is essential. Let me give you a few things about Revelation. Revelation is not about a what? It's not a bunch of facts about this book and facts about places, the Holy Land. and It's not a bunch of information about uh, our catechism and, and stuff. No, Revelation is purely, completely, absolutely, and only about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If it doesn't have anything to do with Him, don't worry about it. I don't care if you're a nuclear physicist and you can divide atoms and do all this stuff. That's worthless information in eternity. All we want to know is who Christ is, what He's done, why He did it, and where He is now. It's about who. We can understand and acknowledge all the facts. He must be revealed to a sinner in order for salvation to occur. And here in Ephesians 1, look at verse 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and what's this? Revelation. And the knowledge of what? The knowledge of where he was born, the knowledge of how many kings were there, the knowledge of who was the Pharaoh, no, in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of whose calling? His calling. And what the riches of the glory of oh, His inheritance in the saints. You see, it's about a person. Follow this. What's the exceeding greatness of whose power? His power. To usward, who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought. Where's all this? It's in Christ. When he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. For above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only is this wor in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under whose feet? His feet. And gave who? Him. To be the head over all things to the church, which is whose body? His body. The fullness of who? Him. It filleth all. Revelation's all about a person. That's all it is. Turn quickly to Romans chapter 10. How is Christ revealed? That's a good question. Well, the Apostle Paul said, when it pleased God. When? It pleased God. When is it? When it pleased God. When will He reveal? When it pleases Him. It can be old or young or in between. But whenever He does it, I don't care much about the when. I just want it, want it to happen. 
to me and to my children and to the beloved and all God's people. Don't care when. Just pray that the Lord will reveal. Paul said, when it pleased God to separate me from my mother's womb, separate me from my imaginations, He called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me that I might preach the gospel among the heathen. How is Christ revealed? Romans 10 verse 14, How shall... How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It's just that simple. You want your children to get this revelation? Buddy, every time that door opens, have them here. Have them here. Now, He may be pleased not to reveal Himself to them, but if He does, I promise you where it's going to be, it's going to be right here. <laughs> Most likely it's going to be right here. All right, look at... Uh, Philippians 2, and let me show you some evidence that this revelation has occurred. And I'm just going to read a portion of Scripture here and then point out the obvious evidences. In Philippians 2, verse 1 begins, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you... Be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. All God's people get the same revelation. I'm sorry, we do. We see Christ. Now, I understand some get gifts and have more discernment and this kind of thing, but I tell you what, we all got revelation. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted and given him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Evidence of revelation, folks, number one, bow to the Lord Jesus Christ in everything. Number two, we'll confess Christ before God. Amen. They'll go in the pool. We'll be baptized. Evidence is that we will show as we have, uh, uh, we will show mercy as we've been shown mercy. In regard to love, we'll both give and receive love. Fellowship will be sought with God and with God's people. Joy will be found in the gospel and with God's people and less with the attachments of this world. And we don't do these things to prove that we've had the revelation. No, we do these things because we've had the revelation. Does that make sense? We don't try to behave like good church-going people. We do, but we're not doing it so God will save us. The only, reason, only way we do it is if God has saved us. Turn to Revelation 21. If you want to put a little mark there in Philippians 2, hold that. We're coming back to that in a minute. I want to show you one other thing there. But in the meantime, turn over to Revelation 21. And I want to show you... How far afield this whole business of imagination can take us. Natural man lets his imagination run wild and has no real interest in the revelation of God. And the evidence of that, if, if you had had a conversation with somebody about heaven, and usually it goes through, well, I know I'm going to see mommy there, I'm going to see daddy, or I'm going to see somebody that's gone before them. But if you, if you ask them, you know, what do you know about heaven kind of thing? I suspect most of the time, you know what you're going to hear? Oh, there's streets of gold. And many of us may, may think, well, that's maybe what I know best. There's streets of gold. And now that's not total imagination. That's based in some fact. But let me show you what the real truth about that is. Turn to Revelation 21, verse 21. And it says... John said, I was there, and he said, I saw 12 gates that were 12 pearls. Every several gate was one pearl. I, and what he's saying there is there's a pearl there big enough to make a gate. That'd be something to see, wouldn't it? But look what next it says. 
and the street of the city was pure gold as it were transparent glass. I'd never seen this. There's no S on street. There's not high streets and low streets. There's not ghetto streets and gated community streets. There's not rich streets and poor streets. There's one street in glory. You know why that is? We're all the same. We're all the same. Why? Do, we just need one street. There's only one place to go to the throne of glory. Where, where else? Who wants to veer off that street? Everyone lives on the same street. We're all in Christ, the same. We're perfect in Christ. And God's Word reveals this about gold in heaven. You know what it's worth up there? Apparently about the same thing that concrete, asphalt, gravel, and dirt is worth in down here. Just pave the roads with it. Now it must be beautiful. But there's a reason why gold has no value in heaven. You know why? There remains for those who are there nothing they want to buy. Nobody's mining gold up there. Nobody's putting back money. Nobody's coveting what you got because it's the same as I got. You see, folks up there already have all. They're in Christ. Got it all. And the Lord Jesus Christ, here's why there's nothing up there to buy. The Lord Jesus Christ bought all we need already with His precious blood. He's given each and all of them up there redemption and salvation. He gave His life that they might have that life. He lived that they might not have to die. What's money or gold compared to that? Well, just pay the streets with it. The revealed Christ is all God's people need or want. All right, Second or First Corinthians two. First Corinthians two. Let's not be too hard or upset with folks who can't see these things. We didn't see them either at one time. But here's a scripture that plainly declares that they can't see. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 we read, But as it is written, the eye of natural man hath not seen, nor the natural man's ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of those men the things that God's prepared for them that love Him. Folks, they can't see. They're blind. They're deaf. They're dumb. They cannot see Christ and therefore all they have is their imagination. They have no revelation. But now look at the next verse. But God hath revealed all these things unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. And when folks are left to the imagination, let me give you a few things, just a few examples of where, where it finally winds up. Left alone, some folks' imagination is that they're going to have a mansion one day full of vestal virgins. Another group thinks there's 144,000 real special people up there and they get the good stuff. There's another group that thinks, uh, well, the atheist imagines that there is no God so he doesn't have to worry about it while he's down here. The Arminian imagines good works so he has more crowns and a bigger mansion in glory. The Catholic imagines purgatory. That's a place where you go if you weren't really quite good enough and you go there because you were just medium bad, not real bad. And folks here can pray you out of that place if they pray a real, real lot. That's imagination and not the Word. And isn't it sad and heartbreaking? Listen, you and I were in that place. I remember being taught as a 15-year-old to walk down the aisle in front of the procession carrying a cross. Thank God He revealed Christ to me and delivered me from the imagination that I was doing something good or holy, that it might help me in some way. God's people don't depend on imagination. We have revelation. And the Spirit of God reveals Christ to His people. How? By the preaching of God's Word and the power of God's Spirit. Now, 
Go back to that Philippians 2 scripture. We're just about done here. Go back to Philippians 2. Let me summarize something for you. This is really profound. If you, I don't think I ever say much. It is profound, but I, I pray this is by the Spirit of God. The book of Genesis and the whole Bible teaches that man was made in the image and likeness of God, but we destroyed ourselves. We sinned, and we, we brought condemnation on ourselves. The whole Bible teaches that Christ, who is God, listen to me, was made in the image of man, that we might not die eternal death, and that we might be made perfect. Do we see the absolute perfection and balance of God's plan? He made man in the image of God and we messed it up. We introduced sin and therefore our image became imagination. God made His Son in the image of man to do what we couldn't do. He lived perfectly. Never once did He imagine a thing. His image was perfect in the sight of God. And therefore, when you and I get there, we got a perfect image. We're righteous and holy before God. And then He let these men over here who were twisted and warped and out of their minds lay their hands on His Son and kill Him. Why? Because that's what we had coming. And He put it on His Son. And we go free. That's why we can go to glory and we don't need anything else. Not a thing. And let me show you this in Philippians 2 verse 5. Maybe you noticed it the first time I read it. You see here in verse 5 says, Let this mind, not imagination, let this mind be in you, the mind of revelation, which was also in Christ Jesus. See, we get His mind. Who being in the form, and you know what that word is? Being in the image of God, thought not, Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because He is God. But made Himself of no reputation, and took upon Him the image of what? Of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Do you see how this is? What a beautiful plan this is. Salvation is perfect. Let me back that up with one other scripture quickly. Romans 8. Let me show you the consistency of the scriptures, of this revelation. There's a double confirmation of what we're talking about. Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. He's put away the sin. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son, look at this, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ was so much a man that He could be us. And God punished Him in our place. He was so much a man that when He lived perfectly, and we're in Him, we do too. We see the beauty of that, of God's plan from the beginning. And we'll close with Matthew 11. Turn over to Matthew chapter 11. Folks, this is not imagination. It's revelation. Natural man cannot conceive of anything, cannot imagine anything this wonderful. But once God reveals it to a person, there's nothing more amazing or wonderful or glorious then Christ Jesus our Lord, once He's revealed to us. He's our Savior. He is living, He lived for His people, and He died for His people. And follow this just a minute. Our imagination is a tremendous and terrible burden. I mean, we look at something and it gets all out of focus and out of whack. What's wrong? My imagination's come into play. It's cute when they're little kids. 
and think they can fly. It's not funny anymore when we're placing our entire eternal life on that information, on what we think. God help us. It's a terrible burden. No wonder that men who wrote great songs go, do I know the Lord or no? <laughs> That's why we got to keep coming back here and somebody stand up here and tell us, all, reveal all over to us, tell us again, it's not your imagination. Get back, get back on the track here. Our imagination confuses us, it wearies us, it misleads us, and there's a terrible end to it all. The Scripture says, come to Christ. And here's the Scripture. Matthew 11, verse 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son. Here again, aren't you glad there's not a period there? And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now you know who he reveals him to? Be this. He says, you want, it? You want that revelation? Verse 20, he says, come to me. Come to me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, is your imagination driving you crazy? <laughs> Bearing you down, wearing you out? Come to me and I'll give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden's light. Being without Christ is hard work. It's heavy labor. It's tough. Come to Christ, you can sit here and just bathe in the, in the glory, in His glory. It's the good way. It's the way. All right. You got a song pick, 